This is an Amiga 1200. For anyone familiar with them, you would expect this normally to be in one of those wedge-shaped cases with the integrated keyboard. But that's not how this one is set up. I think it was set up in England using a uh, motherboard direct from Commodore, and it was used in this one RU rack mount enclosure in a commercial context. And as I understand it, that context was providing for a channel in a hotel television system that contained a slideshow of, of the, uh, there we go, focus, which contained a slideshow of hotel services and other stuff. I purchased it to use as an Amiga, and um, I'm going to show you inside it, a bit of a talk about it sorts of things that had to be done um, there's more information about it on my blog as well so let's get the lid off it um, I'll get the screws out there you go so <clears throat> starting up the front here we have a floppy drive which I think isn't a genuine Amiga type floppy drive it's a PC one and there are some bodges back here on the bottom of the board to allow that to happen. I haven't undone them. I could, but I haven't bothered. And part of the reason for that is that fairly recently on AmyNet, there's a new piece of software called ImageMount, which is a graphical user interface on a drive mounting, on, on drive mounting software. And it can mount anything from floppy drives to hard drives. And the um, the joy of that is I can now take a Amiga ADF type file, a floppy disk image file. I can quickly mount it with the graphical user interface. And if I want to, and as I have done, I can then create a, no, a, a non-volatile RAM disk, copy that virtual floppy in there, reset the machine and boot from from that virtual RAM disk as if it was a floppy, you know, which has been a great solution on the few times I've wanted to do it. I'm a bit of a fan of a composer called Format, and I have some of his music um, on floppy disk from from the um, from the from the olden days, and I still buy some of Format's music on Bandcamp. But to be able to listen to it being sort of composed in real time on hardware like that upon which it was composed is, is a special treat and so that's that's what I was doing when I built that rad disc up I think it was yesterday I last did it so floppy drive drive lights this fascia panel and this zinc plated panel didn't line up properly when I got it I had to slightly file this so that I could get those lights to pass through they, they were not in it when I bought the machine and they, they could not have been in it they just didn't fit over here is a compact flash card. Um, people who are into this stuff will know, but others won't, that the, all the pins in a compact flash card match up with the old school ribbon cables um, once you get the form factor right. I can't put a second card in there at the moment. I need to buffer this IDE connector. It's not the best. Um, I do have the hardware to do that, but I haven't done it. it it's fine. Eight gigabytes is a ridiculous amount of storage for a computer that probably shipped with somewhere between 40 and 60 megabytes of hard drive storage. So that's that's been been plenty. And I can just back this up on the PC if I want to, or do big file transfers with it mounted in an emulator on a PC, which is how I set it up in the first place. Heatsink here on Alice, as recommended by the manufacturer of this board, which we'll get to. <coughs> That's attached with proper thermally conductive epoxy. It's a bit of a one-way street, but it's the best way to guarantee the longevity of that chip. So that's what I did. Here is a little board that plugs in over the top of a chip, and it means that when the computer's reset, the PCMCIA slot over here can reset. And I put a network adapter in there, um, not any one will work, you need a very old school format of the of the uh, network adapter. It goes in there, and when I reset, it resets properly. It also provides some extra um, 
connectors for expansion cards should I ever need to tie back into that chip which which may be handy I, I, I don't know I get nearly two megabits off this on a good day which is pretty good certainly for a computer like this I mean at the time that it was released a 9600 bit per second um, modem would have been about right um, which is you know orders of magnitude or oh, is it well it's, I can't do the maths while I'm trying to to talk at the same time but <clears throat> 9600 board is 9600 bits per second and I'm talking about transfer rates um, in the order of 2 megabits per second um, un unthought of over any kind of modem that a consumer would ordinarily have bought this fellow here is an Indivision um, AGA Mark II I think it's called and, and it plugs onto a, the, a graphics chip there and takes signals and runs them through, I think, an FPGA and gives me a DVI output over here. It's imperfect in some ways. <clears throat> I really just want a straight either HD or some configurable standard output from, from this connector, but it can be different depending on the screen mode, and it's possible that's down to configuration, but I found it not simple to configure and with its default settings it works and I think I think that speaks well for the product um, I'm quite happy with it and I wouldn't remove it um, and update it or anything it, it, it works great and I can still use the pardon me <coughs> I can still use the original Amiga video output if I like to this part here goes into a slot that the keyboard ribbon cable used to fit into and it gives me some wires over here to this port which I installed by drilling a hole in the case like I installed it from scratch and that port is a keyboard port and there are a bunch of different versions of this by different makers this one there are a few compromises in how many key presses at once it could register I think it was a maximum of four but the um, keyboard port on here is ready to go on any standard Amiga big box computer keyboard like a 2000, 3000 or 4000 or even a, or even a 1000 with the right adapter I imagine. So it does all of that but it also will just take a PC um, PS2 style keyboard directly without any adapting at all and that makes it really versatile and I've used it in both ways many times and it has it has never failed um, I think it might be a PC key but I, I don't remember exactly um, but I think it's the only one available though that supports the kind of functionality I was just talking about it's it's really good over here is another product from individual computers just like this video adapter oh, I should say too there used to be a adapter here for RF like for a television tuner output and I just removed that to make space for this adapter and I was never going to tune this computer into an analog television and I can't imagine anybody ever would well they may have done once but certainly not now in the 21st century this is a 68030 accelerator with over 100 megabytes of RAM on it a ridiculous amount of RAM for a computer like this when it was released but quite handy for for running games on on this computer that were designed for a computer a, a console on a mega console called the CD32 there's still very little use for that much RAM I do have one game I think it's beneath a steel sky that that caches all of the sort of spoken dialogue from the sort of point and click adventure game into RAM about 100 megabytes but aside from that I've, I've never used more than a fraction of it it's 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 overkill but oh, it's nice to have and, and that amount of RAM for something like this today is is not a massive additional sort of cost imposition once the, the cards already being built so I'm very glad to have it 
Um, the card's been great. It's attached through here with a nylon screw to a sticky um, pad on the board. And I did have a little bit of trouble with it at one stage, and I think it was because I had actually arranged this so it was pretty much perfectly parallel to the motherboard. And in the trap door of an Amiga 1200, I think it probably would be on a bit of an angle. <clears throat> and so I shortened this slightly and, and pulled it over just a couple of degrees. And it's gone from being sometimes not quite right to being spot on all of the time. So that was an interesting lesson in sort of what can happen with an excess of precision. <laughs> um, by tilting it over a little bit, of course, I've, I've forced the little contacts on here sort of harder down onto the the gold contacts of the Amiga it's got a clock battery on the other side of it I think next time it fails I might use this clock port here for it though so that I don't even have to remove this to change the clock battery um, not that a real-time clock matters that much on a computer of this age so is that everything floppy compact flash adapter cable DVI out Indivision AGA Mark II, I think CR, little PCMCIA socket reset fixer or upper, which is unnecessary. You can do it in software. You can just remember to turn the computer off and back on again, but oh, the time you forget and then your network card doesn't configure properly and just plug one of them on. They're only cheap. There's not only a few transistors, I think, on it. Um... I'm only using Kickstart 3.1 ROMs, they're fine, I use Classic Workbench on this and love it. Um, I've got a few Amigas and this is my Classic Workbench AGA setup, I, I, I really like it. Accelerator, keyboard output, I did have to extend that to get it all the way over there. I can't remember how I did it, but at some stage I must have bought Technicolor ribbon cable. Well, I didn't match the colours. There you go. But that's that's what I've done. This was... I think I extended it. It's long enough ago, so I just don't recall. Oh, the only other thing I can say about this is I've replaced all of the capacitors. Um, there are a bunch of ways to get them off. Um, the right way to do it is with a hot air gun and all sorts of steps to make sure that, you know, the ones down in here the hot air doesn't melt the keyboard connector and all sorts of stuff. The other way to do it is to cut them off, which is quite triggering for a lot of people who have the proper skills to do it with hot air. <clears throat> I found that with extreme care and holding the capacitors in place with a, with a pencil with an eraser on the back and having a, a couple of different size cutters, that there was just, it was no trouble at all. That's probably partly because this computer was in great condition. The capacitors <coughs> hadn't leaked and eaten the circuit board at all. That They can and they will. Um, this rack mount case was operated in an air-conditioned environment and offers fairly decent ventilation. The air can come in down the sides and comes out over the top here. The only capacitor that had leaked was one which is no longer in service and it was for the... Um, I think composite and RF video output circuitry. Um, I think it was the one that directly drove some part of the composite video output and no doubt it saw a lot of stress in the hotel application I described at the start of this video. Um, capacitors are just that I used are just standard Panasonic surface mount electrolytics. Hopefully they will or they should significantly outlast the original capacitors. They're, I believe, just of a better quality. They were soldered in with a minimum amount of additional heat. Um, I, I don't, I don't see, I don't see them, them failing anytime soon. And it may be that when they do, they, they don't leak excessively and destroy things in the way that the original ones did. So, I mean, I don't, I don't expect them to to be a problem in my lifetime, especially given the amount of use they get, which is limited, and the relatively cool temperatures they operate at in in this um, rack mount case. Make sure that doesn't get pinched. So the um, yes, the, the the capacitor replacement on here went really well. 
I'm not going to go into the details here. There was a video I saw recently which showed a fairly sort of mechanically sympathetic way of cutting capacitors off a board. Um, there are some on YouTube which are genuinely horrible to watch, um, but it, it, it can be done, um, in my experience, um, on a board which is in good repair without causing any, any obvious damage. Um, soldering them on was fun, there's not a lot of room. The keen-eyed may see that I bumped the side of this audio connector here with the soldering iron which I cursed about at the time. It's very minor, but all the same, you know, but these ports are freely available should I ever want to replace them. And I did find that using liquid flux, both on the board and on the bottoms of the legs of the capacitors really assisted with wicking up the solder. And um, of course, the, the capacitor needs to be flush on the board, so tin, I tinned one side of the, of, the, of the board, put the capacitor on, applied some heat, and then soldered the other side. Tinning both sides means that one side of the capacitor is up in the air on a, on, a, on a bit of solid solder and then has to be kind of bent down to it, which is, which is not cool. So, Amiga 1200 in a rack mount case. It's pretty odd. Um, I usually use it like that, ironically enough, which <laughs> which gets pretty close to um, being in the same sort of setup as, as the original as the original Amiga twelve hundred. Um, but it, it works great, and I really like it, and I really like its sort of provenance and its quirks. Um, I wouldn't consider putting it into a standard case for a moment. And for me, it's my only AGA chipset machine. So with the 68030 in it, um, it, it runs everything that an Amiga 1200 could and most things that an Amiga 4000 would um, without needing any sort of modern, um, you know, sort of accelerators based on on technology that wasn't broadly available when the machine was first manufactured and and I, and I like that I mean there are a bunch of people doing great work with Raspberry Pi accelerators for these now and, and, and they're a great thing um, I found though that I have a tendency if I'm going to do any kind of emulation to just go hard on emulation and I've got a blog post about that um, and I've also got a blog post with more photos and details of this that I'll link to in the description.